is Dr. Grace Alexandra Williams, and I'm very happy to be introducing the next panel entitled Radical Curating versus Curating the Radical. Our first speaker is Rachel Minot, who's here. Um, Rachel is a Jamaican born artist, researcher, and curator who champions the idea of self authored histories, and she actively challenges the concept of neutrality in public spaces. Rachel holds an MA in, art, in the Arts of Africa, Oceania and the Americas from Sainsbury's Research Unit at the University of East Anglia and a BA in Art and Art History from the University of Reading. She was the recipient of the Robert Sainsbury's Bursary in 2016, the Owen Ridley Prize for Art in 2014 and the finalist for the Platform Art Award in 2014 also. She is currently pursuing further research into national representation in Jamaica. Previous curatorial work has been with Birmingham Museums Trust, which I was lucky enough to come and discuss with you in one of our short films earlier this week. Um, but she's also worked with the London Transport Museum, Reading Museum, and the Robert Sainsbury's Library. So without further delay, I'd like to introduce Rachel. Thank you. Um, I'm not really going to refer to this PowerPoint, so it's just going to go on in the background. It's largely irrelevant. And um, I am concerned about the actual relevance of my paper in general today, but I'm going to plow ahead. So thank you so much for having me today and for your attention as I string together some disparate thoughts and reflections. If my paper does not seem coherent, Please consider it a purposeful critique on linear histories and evolving canons. And if uh, my scattiness comes across, think of that as an artistic performance. Um, and do not hold out any excessive hope for a well-formed conclusion. So uh, this paper is a reflection on silence. It's a reflection on the active action of silence. In the context of this conference, in the paper, in this panel, silence will be explored as a radical tool for curating, as well as a radical object that we must curate. I'll be speaking about a number of projects which I've worked on, both as an artist and as a freelance curator, exploring how silence in museological, museological canons has been responded to, and how responding to silence with silence is an active as, and defiant as returning an objectifying gaze. One of my most recent bodies of work has been as a freelance researcher and curator at Birmingham Museum and Art Gallery. Um, for which I facilitated the collaborative curation of two cross-collection exhibitions. The first is The Past Is Now, Birmingham and the British Empire, in which we work towards telling the story of the British Empire in a very specific Birmingham context, as it related to the lived experiences of the people in Birmingham today, through collaborative collaboration with six activists who were extremely passionate and unsatisfied dissatisfied, sorry, by museum practices. And through this exhibition, we try to explore decolonial theory through a democratized and collaborative working model that truly shifted the authority from the internal curators to our external activists. Um, so that display ends on Sunday, the 24th of June. Uh, the second exhibition that, I that will replace the past is now um, opens on 24th of July and is entitled Within and Without Body Image and the Self, and that's the other project I worked on. Again, collaboratively curated, this display looks at the effects of absent public representation of diverse bodies on individual self-image, exploring the question, what happens if you never see representations that look like you? And inversely, what happens when you only see representations of people like yourself? Um, we'll be filling the gallery with images and objects relating to bodies that we, th we perceive to be historically underrepresented in art and other visual um, mediums. So both displays are active responses to absence. The first looking, at the looking to supplement historical erasure of the complex and traumatic history of the British Empire from public spaces, um, public sites of memory in the UK. And the second explores the absence of bodies deviating from the norm in public spaces, especially the absence of representation as it enables discussions on comple the complexities of body image identities for these different individuals. Um, and both are looking to address the absence of public voices in curation of museum collections. Um, both, products are, both projects are excellent examples um, for, when dis for discussing the dynamics between institutions and external partners. Um, and so the paper, I'll refer to both of them throughout, with a focus primarily on the past is now because that project ended and is easier to reflect upon in its entirety. Um, I'll also refer in part to some of my artistic practice, which is where some of the pictures come from. Um, and some of my research, but not very much actually, so ignore that. Primarily, this is a meditation on the concept of silence. So, why silence? 
Well, because silence is deafening. It says so much more than words. It speaks of indifference, fear, anger, pain, and shame. Or perhaps it's a pause. Maybe it's thoughtful, calculating, measured, and critical. Or it's respectful, memorializing, a moment of silence for lives lost. Or maybe we just have to shut up and listen. Or maybe we can't speak at all. Or maybe we just won't speak. The multiplicity of silence is why I argue that silence is a tangible thing that we must curate. It is present in all the work that we do, and if we ignore it, it can be misconstrued or misrepresented. And perhaps our audiences won't think that we know it's there. And if we ignore it, they might not know that it's there. In practices I've been involved in, in collaborative work, there has been a lot of damage and progress through the use of purposeful silence and the enforcement of silence upon dissenting voices. In these scenarios, that which was not said was much bigger than that which was said. So the title of my paper was inspired by lyrics to Kate Bush song, because I take my practice very seriously. Um, the song is This Woman's Work. Um, so for those of you who are unfamiliar or haven't mem memorized the entire song lyrics, um, they actually state, of all the things we should have said that we never said, all the things we should have done that we never did, all the things that you needed from me, all the things that you wanted for me, all the things I should have given, but I didn't, oh darling, make it go away. So there's a lot in there, and I'll unpack this as we go through, um, but this will form the structure of my paper. The style falls in line with practices I've seen from cultural and heritage practitioners and researchers from the Caribbean, in which they use song lyrics as the basis for their presentations, as good punctuation for academic theory, while still being succinct and well thought out words that also add poetry, rhythm to the papers that they're presenting. And as we all know, silences, pauses, beats, are all inherent to both music and poetry. Dr. Williams did a wonderful job of illustrating uh, the power of um, pauses and breaks and creating uh, meaning and eliciting actions from those who hear them and make them earlier. Uh, recently, I sat in the audience as Wayne Modest, a practitioner from uh, Tropa Museum in, in Holland, um, sang Bob Marley lyrics throughout his keynote speech at the British Museum exhibiting an experience of Empire Conference in March. Wayne repeated the statement, we refuse to be what you want us to be. We are what we are. That's the way it's going to be. If you don't know, you can't educate I. And these are lyrics from Bob Marley's song, Babylon System. Through his presentation, he spoke about quiet resistance and the strength of, of presence and the act of resistance through steady change in museum practices. It was really inspirational, and I'm going to follow suit. So following the structure of the lyrics, let me begin with one of the things I should have said, but I never said. I wish I had chosen a reggae song or a dance hall song which I used to speak to continue this presentation in this place entirely in Jamaican Patois. I can't. I can barely speak the language I used to know. My accent is not a voice that I remember. It is not the tone of my family, and it does not call me home. The way I speak now in this space, and the way I write when I write for museums, is not my voice. It is a neutralized voice. It is a voice I imagine to be easily understood non-offensive, and above all, palatable. But when we first start working in a museum, made it follow me model rule. Rachel Minot. If you know I'm nothing good for saying, nobody say nothing at all. So see me there? Let me pop up my foot. Look on the computer, cup up me here. And what that? Dangerous assumption about a culture, different culture man here? Zip. Nobody chat nothing, Rachel. What's that? Is that a boring whitewashed version of the history? Zip. Rachel, no say nothing. That was a silence of my self-preservation and fear. A silence that strongly developed my internal monologue. That was her speaking. She doesn't speak pat the way I used to, but she's very sassy, and I quite like her. Um, that silence allowed me to progress in the industry. I wasn't seen as problematic or defensive or difficult. Instead, I proved myself a team player, hardworking, and a joyful presence to any team. As I progressed, my silence started to feel violent, not just to the people that I wasn't engaging with, but with the people that I was not representing and the fights I wasn't fighting. 
now, when you hear Pamela Pete, oh my God, what are brown people there? But in the same breath, I'm sorry, but you don't have enough volunteering experience to get in the museums. Me say something. Me say, but every one of the we did have a volunteer. I'm sorry, that is just the way it is. Let me check you. Me see what you say, but now everybody wants us to do happy work for free or for equal for them all freaking life. Working for free means something different to you than it does to them. Working on collaborative display at Birmingham Museum, my inner model long was brought to the fore. I was asked to discard my silence to be inclusive, to break barriers and to broaden the conversation. I realized how important it was to break the cycle of the ghettoization of black history by involving as many people as possible in the really difficult, wrong version of the conversation. What you have to ask in this interaction, was that person just rude or racist? Where you have to say that this is the moment that if you defend the British Empire, you are going to be breaking a social taboo. You will be breaking trust. This is the point when you, the museum representative, needs to sit back silently and allow space for those who have been silent to vent, to release their silent anger. This is them breaking their silence. This is their exhale. This is the moment when you can gain someone's trust or lose it forever. This is where you must curate the silence, placing it strategically through interactions, using it to make room for a new story, like it's an expensive display case used for a new acquisition. Treat the new work, the new perspective offered, as valuable. You don't place the old work next to it, except to create a conversation that in many ways elevates the new over the old. But do engage. The silence you use here is not the silence of indifference. This is the ideal space for the silence of respect. This is the thing we should have done, but we didn't. Especially not in the first iteration of a collaborative curation. In our institutional response to the violent silencing of the British Empire, there was a lot of reactive behavior, defensiveness from our practices as, of our practices as curators and our disciplines and of the British Empire in general. And in not being silent, we silenced. The size and scope of the museum meant that when we weren't making the co-curators use their internal voice, we were creating signals that um, socially triggered defensive silences as protest. By speaking so often, we reduced the proportion of time that they were allowed to speak. So museums have to face this defensive silence now, coming from the communities of color who do not trust us with the knowledge that they hold, who do not trust us with the knowledge they hold. And so they're not sharing it because they don't care about us. They have written us off as institutions as spaces for them, and so respond to our earnest inquiries with active silence, silence of defense or indifference. And I'm obviously generalizing here, but this is um, for the point of the argument. And institutional questions have become much more earnest. Today, we're facing a huge lack of diversity in the industry, as well as a scenario of ever dwindling resources, mostly of time, money, and staff, but we still have objects. And with funding bodies placing diversity at the core aim to be fulfilled, there is a monetary need to fill the silences that show a lack of representation. There's also an ideological awakening in museum practice that we have been violently silencing, that we have done this to communities we now need to and want to represent and include. And so we realize that our be best practice has not been best for all. It has perpetuated hierarchies and stereotypes that are dangerous and painful. And now, we're left to the discipline that due to historical misbehavior, or lack of discipline, tells a very narrow version of events, can it visualize it's very singular perspectives. And those perspectives are not representative of the country as it exists today. Now, all the things that are hard to need audiences need from us. This was funding, trust, power. These are the things we need from them now, and if not now, then very soon. The tide is shifting. Just ask the Carters, that's Jay-Z and Beyonce. Um, they represent all the things that I wanted for community of colors. Ownership over um, to occupy museums and reinterpret art and narratives that we hold. But what silence will be used to get us there? Will it be calculated or full of shame? 
I would argue that at this point, the things that we should have given but we didn't is a moment of silence. We reflect upon how much damage has been done to reflect on the lives lost and never memorialized of cultures damaged through violent suppression. In this moment of silence, it's for those people who have been working towards changing our discipline, but for us to really consider how we can move forward so we don't perpetuate the mistakes of the past and continue to create a space that is violent in its silence. So to end my paper, and to make it go away, I wanted to just draw some ideas together. Museum and galleries who attempt to work this work, they need robust mechanisms for responding to critique. We can't engage, nor should we try to engage in radical curating or addressing historical misbehavior, and then we receive rebuttals or engagement with our attempts that are beyond simple praise to respond again with silence. This silence is indifferent, and it creates further space and distance. Our Twitter interactions can't just be jokes and likes and retweets. We need to engage with the tough questions. We need to be prepared to engage in conversations that call us out for our discipline's role in violent silences. The reason I included a bit of patois at the beginning of this paper is to acknowledge the power of multilingualism and the respect of treating different languages as worthy of being used for interpretation and in museum spaces. It responds to the repeated conversations that we had throughout the first project about languages and native language loss in the face of European colonization, particularly during the past is now, um, and resulted in a partnership that we engaged at the end of the project um, with an AHRC, AHRC funded pro, um, project called Mo Creative Multilingualism, Lingualism, in which we were able to, by addressing something we were missing and had been silent, creates an artist residency in which um, a writer and practitioner was able to explore her Jamaican heritage, empire, language, LGBTQ narratives, and faith, and how they intersect through her individual story. The component, components of this are very, are very ever explored in institutions and the intersections. I'm not sure I've ever seen it done before. Um, what I have not been able to explore are detailed examples of silencing in which groups of, are underrepresented in this instance, nor was I able to explore self-silencing, which many of us conduct in the name of neutrality, civic responsibility, and stakeholder um, management and sway, confidential agreements, etc. Um, and I didn't point out the temporality of most of the interventions into silencing. Temporary exhibitions that deeply engage with these issues raised, but once deinstalled, are again leaving spaces of silence. So suffice to say, there's a lot more to unpack um, within this practice, but that's all I have to say today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rachel. Um, I'm sure everybody has burning questions, but we're just going to move on to the next speaker and then we'll take questions at the end. So I'm delighted to invite Dr. Rosamond Garrett, who is currently Bridget Riley Art Foundation Curatorial Assistant at the Courtauld Gallery. Rosamond was trained as both an artist and art historian, gaining an undergraduate MA in Fine Art from the University of Edinburgh and Edinburgh College of Art. She joined the Courtauld Institute of Art for her MA and then her PhD, specializing in the art of Northern Europe in the late medieval and Renaissance period. Her PhD thesis examines and offers a reconstruction of the life of Christ and the Virgin choir tapestry woven around 1511 that once belonged to Canterbury Cathedral. Rosamond also worked for the National Trust, cataloguing their extensive collection of tapestries before working in the Courtauld Prints and Drawing Study Room, and then joining the gallery as curatorial assistant. Here she curated an exhibition um, including Bloomsbury Art and Design, which I believe she's going to reflect on today, um, and she has most recently co-written the catalogue for the exhibition Late Medieval and Renaissance Textiles for the Sam Fogg Gallery in Mayfair, which is currently on display until the 13th of July. Welcome. Thank you. First of all, I just really want to thank Rachel for that paper because I really, really enjoyed it. I mean, I knew I was looking forward to it, but I really enjoyed that paper, so thank you so much. Um, there are definitely some parts of my paper that would have been easier to avoid in the name of neutrality, so I'm hoping that Rachel will um, help me through this at the end. <laughs> so, um, 
The Courtauld holds one of the most extensive collections of paintings, design drawings, ceramics, and furniture by artists from the Bloomsbury Group, a group of artists, writers, and intellectuals who lived and worked in Bloomsbury in central London at the beginning of the 20th century. The majority um, of these works were bequeathed by the artist, art critic, and prominent member of the Bloomsbury Group, Roger Fry, to the newly formed Courtauld Institute of Art in 1935. Fry warmly supported the founding of our institute, which was reflected not only by his bequest, but by his outspoken advocacy for Samuel Courtauld's ambitious project to set up Britain's first centre dedicated to art historical study. The admiration that Fry held for Samuel Courtauld was mutual. Courtauld regarded Fry as the model of an outward-looking and publicly engaged scholar. Both men shared a belief in the social necessity of art and on the obligations that this imposed on those who owned it, studied it, and cared for it. In the autumn of 2016, I was charged with curating a show of the highlights of our Bloomsbury collection here at the Courtauld Gallery, entitled Bloomsbury Art and Design. Just as an aside, you might recognize the case that was in Sasha's uh, paper earlier. Uh, that was an attempt at recycling. Museums aren't usually renowned for their, their recycling abilities. It's very expensive to get these cases made, so we wanted to use it again for the ceramics of the uh, Bloomsbury show. Due to the Courtauld's major redevelopment project, Courtauld Connects, we had an opening in our exhibition schedule that needed to be filled. I had the unusually tight deadline of three months to put this exhibition together, with the prerequisite that I had to plan three versions of the show due to certain works having pre-agreed loans to other museums. In addition, the display would be in place for seven months rather than the usual three, meaning that any works on paper had to be swapped out to avoid excessive light damage to individual works. For an internal exhibition, it was not without its logistical challenges, nor lacking in labels to be written. At this point, I should tell you that my PhD is not in 20th century British art, but in Renaissance tapestry, but as curators, we have to be ready to jump right in. Thanks in large part to Fry's bequest, the Courtauld holds an unparalleled collection of works by the Bloomsbury Group, including a rug, a folding screen, a chair with an embroidered back, a painted spinet, which is a type of small harpsichord, vases, plates, bowls, designs for interiors, textile samples, toy designs, and paintings, to name but a few. Bloomsbury Art and Design explored the breadth of works produced by the group, who, via their aesthetic and technical experiments across a wide range of media, aim to create a colourful new language of art for sober Edwardian Britain. Today, I feel like an advocate for the Bloomsbury artists, but I admit that at first I struggled to like their work. Critics often portray the Bloomsbury Group as a privileged bohemians that merely dabbled in the arts, with the artists in particular enjoying little of the success or renown of their contemporaries. Picasso is often unfairly cited as a comparative. <laughs> the writers have been more justly considered, with Virginia Woolf and the economist John Maynard Keynes widely recognised today. It is their sex lives, however, that have perhaps received the most attention. The group's liberal views and the rejection of the outmoded conventions and restraints of their parents' generation fostered complicated and, at that time, outrageous relationships between members of the group that is often drawn upon for uh, titillating an audience even today. At this point, um, my mother kept sending me this podcast called Gloomsbury. I don't know if anyone else listened to it, but it was essentially about that uh, kind of uh, satire of the Bloomsbury group um, with characters such as uh, Vita Sackcloth Fest and, and others. <laughs> it wasn't very helpful when I was trying to learn about this. <laughs> um, with Bloomsbury Art and Design, it was important to me that the group's artistic contributions took centre stage. As I immersed myself in the research for the exhibition, I came to understand how truly open the Bloomsbury group were to dismantling what they knew, not only in terms of the arts, but in life. By doing so, they questioned the frameworks in which we live and create, radically and playfully toying with these boundaries despite considerable opposition in a way that still has impact, a brave way of thinking and working that I feel remains inspirational. In addition, it became apparent that their audacious social and artistic experiments offered a significant contribution to the development of modern art in Britain. 
Amongst the explosion of colour and experimental forms on show, Bloomsbury Art and Design touched upon the many ways in which the Bloomsbury artists challenged the status quo, including introducing modern European painting to Britain, acting as early advocates for global art, blurring the boundaries between the fine and the decorative arts, and reconsidering the relationship between arts funding and the state, to name but a few. So for those of you who missed the show, I'll do a rapid run-through. On or about December 1910, wrote Virginia Woolf in an essay, human character changed. She wasn't talking about the general election held in that month, or Robert Falcon Scott's expedition to the South Pole, or the suffragette movement, but an art exhibition. Roger Fry had organised a show called Manet and the Post-Impressionists, you might recognise this one, at the Grafton Galleries in London, which introduced the British public to modern European painting, with many coming face-to-face -face with works by Cézanne, Matisse, Gauguin, Van Gogh, Picasso and others for the first time. The show was a public disaster. The show's secretary, Desmond McCarthy, summed up the general reaction, saying, kind people called him mad and reminded others that his wife was in an asylum, <laughs> cutting words to fry as his beloved wife did suffer from mental illness. The press were ruthless, ranging from disdain and dismissal to accusations of psychological degeneracy, sexual perversion, xenophobic resistance to the exhibition's emphasis on French art, and moral outrage that much of the art included non-Western influences, particularly by artists such as Matisse and Gauguin. The Sun and the Daily Mail have been going for a while. Now, firmly embedded in the uh, Western canon of art history, it may seem surprising today that in 1910, these artists, all of whom have works in the Courtauld Gallery, were seen as anarchic and even threatening. They were perceived as undermining the lingering Victorian values of restraint and decorum in their risque content, vibrant colours, excessive handling and lack of perceived finish. At this cultural breaking point, it seemed that challenging public taste was akin to challenging our social fabric. Perhaps we would benefit from a Brexit exhibition. This new vocabulary of artistic freedom, once seen, could not be ignored. The exhibition and the second post-impressionist exhibition in 1912 had become a catalyst for release in the next generation of the young British avant-garde. The oppressive technical finesse, dark palette and moralising imagery of the Victorian age was to be surpassed by the experimental, the playful and the fearless. Fry helped bind together a group of like-minded British artists, including Duncan Grant and Vanessa Bell, the sister of Virginia Woolf. In the works, you start to see the colours of Gauguin, the bold outlines of Matisse, Cézanne's construction of space and depiction of light, hints of Picasso and Braque's cubist forms, and forays into the new fragmented language of futurism. This injection of new inspiration led the artist to experiment with a depiction of light and forms, notably pushing the limits of figuration. As such, they were among the first to bring abstraction to our shores, a form of painting that Fry believed to be most democratic, as to view an abstract work, a person need not bring prior knowledge of ancient or biblical stories. It is interesting to note that the term post-impressionism itself was coined by Fry. Not only were the group interest, uh, inspired by these continental artistic developments, but their appreciation for art came from further afield, including Africa and China. Um, I and you should brace yourselves for this quote from Roger Fry, written in a review of African sculpture in 1920. We have the habit of thinking that the power to create expressive plastic form is one of the greatest human achievements. It seems unfair to be forced to admit that certain nameless savages have possessed this power not only in a higher degree than we at this moment, but than we as a nation have ever possessed it. Uncomfortable reading there. Today, Fry's language shocks us to a degree that we may miss part of his message. He is saying that he believes that the African sculptures that were exhibited in that show to be greater than anything Britain had ever produced. 
In his writings, Fry attempted to dispel the perspective that the established canon of European art history was the sole pinnacle of human artistic achievement. He was among the first to argue, amid much criticism, that not only should an object like a Luba mask or a Song Dynasty ceramic be considered on a par with the European old masters, but that he could certainly surpass them. Today, this may seem like stating the obvious, but at the time of Fry's writing, such a statement was essentially heretical. As an aside, uh, the year that the Courtauld Institute first opened in 1932, Fry was employed as a lecturer here. Also, from this very first year, the Courtauld employed several lecturers to teach global art history. This was not the case from the 1950s onwards, uh, but has been strongly and rightfully reintroduced back into our curriculum by our current director, Deborah Swallow. Fry and the Bloomsbury artists' interest in non-European art was driven in part by the influx of these objects available on the Parisian market. In addition, many of their continental contemporaries collected these objects and had them on display in their studios, Matisse and Picasso to name but two. Uh, here's Matisse, you might recognise him from the Royal Academy show that's just passed. The Bloomsbury artists took their appreciation for global art and used it to inspire their own, openly acknowledging the origins of their inspiration by exhibiting their works side by side with the originals or with photographs of them. Kuba textiles from the Democratic Republic of the Congo, for example, um, you can see some, uh, where's the mouse, here's one, and here's one in Matisse's studio. Um, so Kuba textiles from the Democratic Republic of the Congo, for example, held a particularly strong influence among the group. Uh, Kuba patterns are known for their surface decoration and complexity of design in which they often interrupt the expected line. This interruption can be seen in a number of the Bloomsbury artists' design drawings, particularly for textiles, and is quite unlike the symmetrical, undeviating repeat patterns of European textile design. Fry held a particular interest for Chinese ceramics. This rather fine, small bowl, hand thrown by Fry, echoes Song Dynasty tea bowls. Song ceramics also inspired Fry's monochrome black, blue, and turquoise glazes. Letters to his daughter inform us that Fry took many attempts to achieve just the right shade of turquoise for this vase. These letters are also an endearing window into his personal learning curve in the art of throwing clay on a potter's wheel as he expresses his early frustration and later his delight at his technical progress following his apprenticeship at the ceramics firm Carter & Co. Some of our correspondence with his daughter regarding fry ceramics has, however, caused some confusion. We're still not quite sure if this is a bison as the handle or a Chinese lion, so if anyone can answer that, please do tell us at the end. <laughs> at this point, um, I just want to introduce you to my own favourite object in the Bloomsbury Art and Design Show, this rather unassuming black earthenware dinner plate. This may not look surprising to you. I'm sure you could pick up something similar in the various design stores we have around London. But for Edwardian Britain, the idea of eating off a black matte plate broke all the rules of dining etiquette and seemed simply outrageous. Fry, however, believed that single colour glazes were the perfect foil for food, writing that these black plates are, quote, obviously waiting for salad, vivid green lettuce, shy radishes and magenta beetroots. Fruit would be a futurist feast in those black bowls. As the daughter of a chef, I was immediately struck by how ahead of his time Fry's words proved to be. Not only is he thinking of plating up as an art, but he managed to prefigure the fashion of using dark plates. It wasn't until the early 2000s that chefs started serving food on slates, so only about 80 years after Fry's words. In... 1913, Fry opened the Amiga Workshops, a studio and public showroom that sold furniture, textiles and household accessories made by artists. That's Fry bending over the, the table just there. At the Amiga Workshops, the artists could combine their sense of colour and form from post-impressionist art and apply it to design, intentionally blurring the boundaries between the fine and the decorative arts. Between 1913 and 1919, when the workshops closed, the workshop's premises at 33 Fitzroy Square, Bloomsbury, was the only place in London that you could buy a faux shawl, a post-impressionist chair, or a cubist-inspired rug. 
The aim was not to uphold good taste on elegant wares, but to capture the artist's delight in the act of creation, injecting, quote, the spirit of fun into furniture and fabrics, as he believed, again, quote, we have suffered for too long from the dull and the stupidly serious. He wanted to create what he called objects for common life, believing that by surrounding ourselves with art in our everyday, that we would live richer, happier, and healthier lives. Again, Fry seems to have had a point. A study led by Konrad Kuipers at the Norwegian University for Science and Technology recently found that engagement with art can lower your risk of anxiety and depression. Last year, Simon Stevens, the chief executive of NHS England, advocated for doctors to prescribe museum visits and other cultural activities known as social prescribing, in some cases instead of pills. Fry saw the Amiga workshops as a kind of laboratory of design, but also as a financial model for supporting artists. The artists were given a salary comparative to an office worker. In exchange, they had to work collaboratively at the Amiga workshops for three half days a week, creating designs and painting ceramics and furniture that could be sold. The rest of the time, they were encouraged to focus on their own artistic practice. As we well know, in order to make creative work, it is important to have the physical space to do so and the mental space gained through financial security. This may bring to mind Virginia Woolf's essay, A Room of One's Own, in which Woolf advocates for just that. The artists were encouraged to work collaboratively and anonymously, signing their work not with their own names, but with the Amiga symbol, the Greek letter that we can see in the middle of this plate. That way, patrons would not be distracted by the individual names of certain star artists, and the workshops would benefit as a whole, creating a thriving arts community. The model of the Amiga workshops was the basis for another idea of Fry's in which the state could provide a regular income for artists. In general, Fry believed that direct intervention from the government was rarely beneficial, writing that, quote, we have only to look at our one pound and ten shilling notes, at our postage stamps, at our public statues, at the Admiralty Arch, and alas, too many sad and familiar sights, in order to realise how desperate the situation is. Fry believed that the government would often back the wrong artistic horse, and as such, the state, provided direct, uh, the state providing direct funding would be inadvisable. Instead, he proposed an institution for the execution of experimental designs, not unlike the Amiga workshops. He hoped that funding an institution for artistic experimentation and innovation would not only support British artists, but create an educational and stimulative effect on the manufacturers of the country. Sadly, Fry's vision for this institute never materialised. One wonders what an art college system would have looked like designed by Fry. To conclude, the Bloomsbury Art and Design Display was not only an opportunity to showcase our extensive collection of works by the Bloomsbury Group and the Courtauld's personal connection with Roger Fry, but an opportunity to explore some of the many ways in which the Bloomsbury artists published, um, pushed the boundaries of early 20th century British art, not only aesthetically, but in terms of the frameworks within which we make, use and fund art. The group introduced modern European painting to an unready British audience, acted as early advocates for global art, disintegrated the boundaries between the fine and applied arts with the hope of making art part of our domestic lives, and carefully considered the ways in which we fund and support the arts. All the while, they delivered an injection of vibrant colour with designs that remained playful and full of life. Thanks. Thank you very much to both of our speakers. I think everybody agrees that this was a very powerful panel, lots of interesting ideas, and I'm sure many questions in the audience. We just have until 25 past to take questions, so if I can limit it to two, this is followed by a break, so please then feel free to address both of our speakers. If I could ask you just to sit at the microphones. Um, are there any questions that we can start with? Thank you. Yes. In there. Um, could you talk a little bit about the relationship of your artistry to your curation? Um, so my art practice involves um, looking at um, Jamaican history 
and exploring where historical events have been um, recorded and imagining new artworks in which they, I create an object biography and an invented person who was Jamaican who was responding to something they witnessed about themselves. So for example, the sculpture of the woman, that's Nanny of the Maroons, and she's um, a part of the series that's looking at um, national heroes in Jamaica. And um, she's an amazing figure, and she's very well revered. And the depictions of her are all, um, she, they're all on the money. So all, every Jamaican national hero is illustrated on the currency. Um, but they're all etchings, and for some of them, we don't even know if that's that's them. It's just a picture that's been plucked out. So one figure, Paul Bogle, is used in America to represent another black man in history. Um, but he's a Jamaican national hero, so we hold really tightly to the representation we do have of him. Nanny of the Maroons isn't necessarily known whether or not she existed, but is or is an amalgamation of many historical figures put together. So with that, she also had kind of magical powers in the kind of the story that you hear about her. Like, she was defiant as a maroon, so an escaped slave, um, enslaved woman um, in Jamaica who fought against the British and won. Um, but she was also supposed to be able to catch bullets in her buttocks and fire them back. <laughs> so she's <laughs> superwoman, really. And uh, she's revered in this way that's almost... Not worshipped, but in line with having kind of reliquaries of her, so she didn't doesn't really exist. So that was supposed to be an imagined reliquary where I'd put some a piece of her in it, and people would treat be able to treat the object as if it was a space for it. So my practice is is very much about this imagining this gap and making these fake histories, and then making these fake objects like people. That it's very hopeful that this all existed but wasn't documented. And instead of just saying there's an absence, I've visualized the as absence. Um, and then my curatorial practice is very much informed by that being the ethos that I work with. Um, but um, also project-based funding kind of starts the inspiration. So I didn't have a choice about the British Empire though it was something I've desperately wanted to curate for a very long time. But that was predetermined and I was recruited. And same thing with body image and identity. That was predetermined and I was recruited. And I bring, and I'm very open about the fact that I'm about decolonizing and I'm about looking at different perspectives. Um, and so that's kind of a part of my package, I suppose. Do we have one final question before we break? I thought they were both brilliant talks. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to say to Rachel, why did you think your paper didn't fit with this conference? She said that. Okay. Um, <laughs> I was really wary that it's very museological and not necessarily strictly art historical. And um, I was worried about, about the discipline. I felt like I wasn't in the, in the discipline. If that makes any sense at all, I, I kind of I responded to the 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 call out and I thought, oh yeah, yeah, that makes sense. I'm you know, I'm creative and you know I'm I can talk about radical actions um, and I do art and <laughs> there's that. Um, and then I kind of got here and I was like, oh, I don't have the language. I've, I'm really out of the loop. I haven't really been to an art historical lecture in a while. And then the practices were a lot more project based than the responses that I was I had formulated. And so I thought. I definitely went more like spoken word type presentation than I did art historical presentation as I would normally have tried to if I thought that I should have. And I didn't think I should have. And I'm glad I didn't, but I got really nervous. <laughs> It's funny because having, um, having studied here, uh, both my MA and my PhD, and also now working here on the curatorial team, I feel completely immersed in this, this art historical language, whether it's writing for an academic paper or, or um, museum interpretation, which is slightly different, or for a blog. But obviously with some of the content of this paper, I was really nervous about going after Rachel. <laughs> it is interesting, though. So, yeah, I was interested. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Uh, well, I think it's fair to say that it was an unfounded worry in both parts. Um, we all very much enjoyed the panel. Uh, if I can ask that everybody returns for the next session at quarter to five, um, that would be great. So we are just breaking for a short break. Uh, but if we could uh, show our thanks to our speakers. Thank you.